Uh, before we get started with the uh, uh, city of Lacey, you know, we're the oldest American community in the county, and we're going to be celebrating the newest one, Lacey, in just a little bit here. But before we do that, Karen Johnson, our curator uh, here at the, at the archives, has a, a little presentation to make. We have some new program coming up, and it's, I'll let her talk about it right now. Karen Johnson is our curator. Does this make me the warm-up act to you guys? Yeah, okay, okay. I'm not going to do song and dance, though. That would drive everybody out. I just wanted to make a real brief announcement about a new publication we have called the Thurston County Historical Journal. And a few of you lucky folks have seen it already, but it's really not out for general distribution. Um, Many of you may know Charlie Rowe, who uh, is a longtime member and board member of the Olympia Historical Society and Bigelow House Museum. And this was his his baby. He was uh, the, the leader and spark plug on this um, publication. He thought it was shameful that Thurston County, the capital county of the state, did not have a publication to celebrate Thurston County history. So he went about rectifying that and he got a lot of different heritage groups involved, practically every heritage group in the county. Um, I was the editor on this, and I guess will continue to be editor. John Friedman, my boss, agreed that the Olympia Tumwater Foundation would be the publisher on this. And this first issue has uh, articles in it uh, by Jim Hannum. Many of you may recognize that name. He's a railroad expert about how the Northern Pacific Railroad came to Thurston County. Drew Crooks, you know that name. He wrote an article on Nancy, Jim's Parson, Nancy Jim Parsons, who was a Cowlitz Nisqually Native American basket weaver. I did a short article on when, uh, in 1927, when Charles Lindbergh flew over the Capitol Dome. And Aaron did a photo essay on Lacey's 50th birthday. More to follow on that. Um, so it's a nice little publication, we think. So far, the folks that have seen it have liked it. What I'm announcing here today is that if any of you would like to contribute articles to this, we would be interested in those for future issues. We're looking for factual articles, well-researched articles, uh, personal recollections of your time in Thurston County, really anything to do with Thurston County history, as long as it's factual, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Ken might, might actually get some, some uh, coverage in here. Um, so if any of you are interested in writing or have a subject that you think might work for this publication as we go forward into next year, please talk to me afterwards, um, and I'd be happy to consider what you might have. Okay, thanks. Good, Good warm-up. Thanks, Ken. Good. Good. All right. <laughs> Okay, are we ready to get started here? All right. Christopher Valcho is a retired service or senior aerospace engineer who is enjoying volunteering at Olympia Little Theater, uh, restoring a 1971 Chevy Nova, and spending quality time with his daughter Zia. He has been active for over 40 years, and he's enjoying this opportunity to portray Bob Bloom enormously, it says. Yeah. Chris. I'm going to introduce oh. Bob. Oh, okay, there you go. That's all right. I knew Bob Bloom personally, and uh, Chris looks something like Bob Bloom, but he, 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 he encompasses the aura of Bob Bloom. <laughs> kind of a real person, real proud of himself, somebody that, uh, that he was humble, but he knew that he was the person that could get things done. Bob Bloom is called the father of Lacey. He is a, a handful of businessmen who started, started Lacey going. Uh, he built South Sound Center, which really put Lacey on the map. And he, he did, did a number of things that made Lacey what it is today. Uh, Chris is going to come up here, and he's going to talk to us. Uh, he's, he's going to be Bob Bloom. Bob Bloom, would you please come up here to the, to the podium? Thank you, Don. And thank you, Ken Balsley. Well, good day to you. And there's a good turnout today. Thanks. I didn't expect as many people. Very good. Hope you don't mind if I refer to my notes every so often so I can stay on topic, all right? Now, you know, I never wanted fame. What I wanted was money. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, what I wanted was I wanted to build. I wanted to have my dream realized. And if I happened to make money in the process, well, that was a side benefit. Yeah? But for me, it was all about the deal. Now, at one time, my company 
Capital Development had businesses in 40 states and was worth half a billion dollars. That's billion with a B. Not bad for the son of a janitor, huh? I was born in 1928 in a working class town called Warren, Pennsylvania. And um, my father was a janitor. Now, uh, I quit school after eighth grade so that I could make money for the family because times were tough. Now, um, one of the things that I did, I actually had an awful lot of jobs after that, uh, after I got out of school, and one of the things that I did was shovel coal into the boiler to help my dad make steam and hot water. Janitor's life's not the easiest one. And of course, I wanted to get away from home, so as soon as I was old enough, I joined the Army. There was a war going on at the time, and that was the Korean War. You may have heard of that one. I was in communications. Now, sooner or later, I was posted in California where I met a beautiful woman by the name of Dorothy Olson. Now, she had two sons. One was named Larry, and the other one was named Gary. How many of you remember that? Right? All right. Now, I wound up marrying the beautiful Dorothy and adopting her two boys. Eventually, I was posted than just down the road at Fort Lewis. And when we moved here, we looked around and said that this is the place that we wanted to settle down. This is where we wanted to raise our family. And since I was going to be getting out of the Army, I knew that I needed to have some sort of skill or trade to make money. So, natural progression, I got my real estate license. Now my business was located at the corner of Slater Kinney and Pacific Avenue. How many of you remember that? That was a sporting goods store, and then my real estate office was in the back. Now, things went very well for me, but I realized that after a period of time, I had a decision to make. It dawned on me pretty gradually that I could continue to sell other people's real estate, or I could build and sell my own. So what do you think I did? I got my contractor's license. I managed to swing a construction loan after a period of time, and I built two developments on South College. Who can name those? They were Bel Air and Brentwood, all right? And it was said at one time that if you lived in an apartment in Lacey somewhere, the Lacey area, chances were very good that you were living in a building that my company built. Well, times were good, but they were going to get better, and it was because of the federal government. You see, the federal government, the feds, we're going to be building something called the Interstate Highway Transportation System. And the shorthand for that is freeways. Well, I knew that freeways were going to change the way that America lived. A freeway was, in my thoughts, was like a, a river of commerce, you see, with goods and products and people moving upstream and downstream. And everywhere that there was going to be an off-ramp, there would be a port. Business. Can't go wrong on that. Well, they were going to build that freeway through the Olympia area, but not through Olympia. Well, so the powers that be got together with the powers that be here, got together with the powers that decide where freeways go, and decided to move that freeway so that it did come through Olympia, after all, the way that we know it today. Good thing, too. Now, about the same time, I realized that there was a new concept in shopping going on. Some of you may have heard of this, too. The mall. All right. Now, the shopping mall idea was pretty simple in, in, uh, in theory. So it was where all of these stores, instead of you having to drive all over town to go shopping, you actually could go to one location. There would be big stores, little stores, all clustered together. Don't get me wrong. There were other malls in the area. There was Northgate Mall, north of Seattle. What's that, an hour and a half drive? There was Lloyd's Center in Portland. How many of you remember that? Right. And that was uh, at least a two-hour drive south. But my mall was going to be right here in Lacey, right in the center. People wouldn't have to drive. Knowing this, I started buying up land along Slater County. Pretty soon I found I needed money. So I decided I'd go to the banks in Olympia. Well, guess what happened there? They laughed. The bankers laughed. And they said, who would want to get in a car and drive to Lacey to go shopping? No, thank you. Well, no, thank you, gentlemen. I wound up going to New York City to get the financing for that. And on the way back, I decided to stop in Chicago. You see that one of the concepts that made a mall work was that you had to have a strong anchor. An anchor store would be 
big box store, as they're called now, and that would be where people would come in all the time for that big box store. Well, they would stay to do their other shopping as well. I wanted the very best anchor I could get for my mall because I wanted my mall to be the best and succeed. Well, the company I was going to go see in the Chicago area was Sears, Roebuck & Company. Unfortunately for me, Sears, Roebuck & Company had a policy. If you wanted them to build in your community, you had to actually give them the land. Now, that was a third of the land that I owned, and I wasn't about to give it up, but they had me over a barrel. What was I going to do? So it turns out I gave in, and I gave them the land to build that. I'm trying to get the thing to Yeah. Not my job. <laughs> now, for those who don't know, this is Sears right here. And they own all that property. So we are looking to the east. Freeways on your left, northbound I-5 going that way. All right. With the Sears in the corner. Older photograph. And there it is, 1966. We'll get to that in a minute. So uh, it turns out that I needed something else, too, after I got them. Oh, uh, th I, I forgot. There was one thing that I learned about this. In negotiations with Sears, I discovered always bargain from a position of strength, never bargain from a position of weakness. And I carried that principle forward for the rest of my working life. Now, I needed a couple of other things to make this whole project work out. That was I needed street lights, and I needed sidewalks. I needed streets. I needed gas, plumbing underneath the ground. I needed electric systems, sewers, all of this stuff. Well, I couldn't afford that, and I certainly knew that the banks in Olympia had no interest in helping me whatsoever. Remember, this is the early 1960s. So I got together with a few other like-minded people in the area, and we decided that we would try to get the area currently known as Lacey incorporated into a city for the first time. Well, what we wanted to do was actually leverage off of their ability to issue bonds and help pay for this. Everybody would win on it. 1964, ladies and gentlemen, we tried and we failed. The city was not incorporated. We learned something from that, too. Don't reach too big. You take small steps and you'll get to your journey just the same. Now. Uh, construction continued. It went very, very well. In fact, I even managed to get another anchor store, and that was F.W. Woolworth. How many of you remember that? Yes, indeed. Uh, America shops there. Now, it was quite a feather in my cap. Construction went very, very well, and we opened uh, officially for business with a big ceremony on October 12, 1966. That was Columbus Day. We had thousands of people show up, more people than I thought we would have. We even had Miss Washington. Sandy Hill come up from Centralia to cut the ribbon in a big ceremony. Everybody was there. Now, it turns out that for the next 20 years, that South Sound Center was the largest retail area in all of Thurston County. Very, very proud of that. Took a lot of work to get there. Now, there was, uh, let me think for just a second, there was a couple of other things involved at the time, too. You know that uh, I was involved in construction as well. You may remember that there was a construction project south of here called the Whoops Project. Anyone? All right, well, the official name for that was, and I quote, it was the Satsup Nuclear Project. And that got shut down eventually. Well, there was a clause in the contract with my construction company. And it turns out that I left that with enough money to be able to buy almost all of the land for the Woodland Square Project, another feather in my cap. As successful a businessman as I was, I did have failures. Yes, folks, I did fail. Among my other projects that uh, didn't work out, one of them was to buy a radio station here locally so I could run my advertising for free. Well, why not? <laughs> People do that all the time. I thought this was a marriage made in heaven. But it turned out to be bleeding. It was in the red all the time. I was spending more money than I was making. You can't run a business at a loss. So I went into the radio station one day, and I asked a brash young fellow there by the name of um, uh, Ken Bosley, as a matter of fact. I asked Ken, what's going on? How come I'm bleeding money here? How can I make money on this radio station? And Ken piped up and said, well, you have too many staff. Well, I went away and thought about that for a while. Long time, until the next morning when I went in and fired half the staff, <laughs> including Ken Bosley. 
Well, another project that I failed at was there was a restaurant that I bought. I think that was called the Red Bull, if I'm not mistaken, if memory serves. And I wanted that restaurant to succeed, but we had a big health scare. Well, I got out of that business too. I sold the Red Bull. And these two failures taught me something else, and it was stick with what you know. I continued to be successful in business for many years after that. In the 1980s, something that I did was my company started buying up shopping centers around the United States. And as I said, 40 states worth half a billion dollars. I turned all of those around, and I either made a profit through selling them or by managing them. And I'm very proud of that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I may be known as the father of Lacey, but you know, I'm just a guy who likes to make a deal and make a little bit of money. So thank you all, and have a great day. Oh, I omitted to mention another event that happened in 1966. We tried a second time to incorporate the city of Lacey. That's why we're here. Oh, yeah. Can't forget that. That's right. And that was December 5th, 1966. All right. All right. Aaron Quinn Valcho is a native of Washington, or a native Washingtonian who grew up in Bellingham and graduated from Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, graduate school took her to Colorado, where she graduated from the University of Denver with a master's in anthropology and museum studies. Uh, she's been a museum professional for over 18 years with positions at the Denver Art Museum, Denver Firefighters Museum, and the Greeley Museums. Uh, she's been the curator at the Lacey Museum now for three years. Aaron. Ken Balsley <laughs> is a local historian. <laughs> Getting no respect around here. <laughs> hey, before we get started here, I want to tell you, I'm really not a historian, because historians have to stick to the facts. Now, I'm just a guy that likes history, and I never let facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Lucky for all of you, I am here to make sure that we do talk about facts and to keep this guy in line. She gave me a script, see? Yes, and, and you will yellow. skip, stick to the script, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Also, a small disclaimer, this presentation may contain talk of a rivalry <laughs> between Olympia and Lacey, but rest assured that is all in the past. What? What do you mean it may contain? That's the whole Just, object for the whole thing, isn't it? Shh, don't give it away. <laughs> Jeez. Get out of Olympia shadow one of these days. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get started. I have to read my script, too. Get close to the mic. Yeah, don't Ah, worry. that's all right. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? All right. Okay, 1961, that's where I'm going to start. 1961 was a good year. You know, Kennedy was in the White House, America was a dominant player in the whole world, and the Beatles hadn't destroyed American music yet. <laughs> it was also a good year in the, in the, to be a resident of Olympia, because Olympia dominated retail sales in Thurston County. 80% of all the retail sales in Thurston County, the entire county, emanated from a four-block area of downtown Olympia. You know, every, every major business in, that you can imagine was there, and it was it dominated all of the retail sales and the tax revenue. It also, the political scene was dominated by downtown Olympia businessmen of the three-member commission. And they liked the way things were run for business purposes. There's only one chamber of commerce, that was the Olympia Chamber of Commerce. But out in the area, out east, out the area that was known as Lacey, things were beginning to stir. Wait just a well, minute. We can't just start there, 1961. Where do you want to start? Well, we cannot forget the 10,000 years of human history that existed here before Historian. the Americans arrived. The Nisqually tribe, our neighbors right down the road, made their living on two million acres from here to Mount Rainier. And we certainly can't forget that the earliest American settlers arrived in the Lacey area in the 1840s and 50s by the Oregon Trail. In fact, this gentleman here, John Hawk, settled the area that we now know as Hawk's Prairie. He came here in 1854, and it's not named for the hawk, like so many people think, but for this fellow, John. And then, 
1891, when the railroad came, that's when things really started to get interesting in Lacey. This little community of woodland, as Lacey was known back then, it got a racetrack, a general store, a hotel, and a post office. It was then that the name Lacey started to catch on. And then in the 1920s, the resort era started in the Roaring Twenties. There were around 19 resorts on the lakes of Lacey at one time or another, and people came from all around the region to vacation and have a really good time. Okay. What? I know that we have a long history of Lacey, but can I get back to 1961? <sighs> all right, fine. <laughs> Go. Is it my turn now? We don't have time to do the whole century, I guess. <laughs> so out in the area that was known as Lacey, entrepreneurs were starting to do things. Things were starting to move. They were, they were chafing at all of the restrictions that the city of Olympia had put on them. And they were looking, trying, removing those roadblocks and trying some new innovative ideas. Now, Lacey already had some businesses, a few stores, restaurants, gas stations, and a small shopping center. Aren't you forgetting something again? Probably. <laughs> Lacey Drive-In? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, how many people remember making out in the Lacey Drive-In? <laughs> nobody wants to know about that, up, Ken. Yeah. I keep telling him nobody wants to know about that. <laughs> I like that you all put your head down so they say that. <laughs> And yep. then also the Evergreen Ballroom, right? The Evergreen Ballroom. Now, how many people danced at the Evergreen Ballroom? <laughs> all right. Hmm. Well, even with all those, with all those businesses, new businesses were probably new businessmen were probably in the outskirts looking for opportunities, taking advantage of cheap land, cheap water, and the demand for for military veterans for houses. Al Thompson was creating the housing developments at Tango Wild and Thompson Place, and Bob Bloom was building, as he said, Brentwood and Bel Air. And Mo Loveless, with the idea of, of a new type of retirement community, had purchased the old Mountain View Golf Course and was beginning to build Panorama City Retirement Community. And at the same time, a small group of Lacey business owners began to talk about forming their own chamber of commerce that would promote their interests. You see, you see uh, Governor Dan Evans over there on the right? Our only three-term governor. In the meantime, events in Lacey weren't going unnoticed by Olympia business interests. While not feeling threatened yet, they did see the possibility existing that the area to the east could be a problem to them. So the city of Olympia began moving forward with a number of annexations to expand its borders. And these annexations were being done without a vote of the people. It was being done by a method called assessed value annexation. And that's when 75% of the property owners get to make the decision. So they would often include areas that included businesses, which were worth more than residential areas. Um, and if you look at the map, those orange areas are what Olympia annexed in the 1960s. So they were very active in their growth during that time period. You can see how far out they went out to towards Lacey there, too. Well, looking out for Lacey's interest was Thurston County Fire District 3, known as locally as Lacey Fire Department. And its ranks were filled mainly by those businessmen that we told you about to, that was out there in Lacey. They'd been volunteering for years to protect the residents and using money out of their own pockets. And they had a lot of influence in the community. In 1964, Fire Chief Rex Jordan was approached by Olympia businessmen to ask for his support and the fire district's support in annexing them into Olympia, knowing how important his voice would be. Well, they said no thanks to that for a couple of reasons. One, it really got their hackles up that um, the residents weren't being given a voice in that decision, that it wasn't being done with an election of the, and a vote of the people. And then secondly, they felt that Olympia's form of government, which at that time was that three commissioner form of government, would not really represent Lacey's interests. What were the chances that one of those people would be from Lacey? Not good. Well, not only did the chief say no, he said, hell no. <laughs> That's not she in the like script. Say, That's not in the script here. <laughs> but he immediately set up a meeting with the uh, Lacey Chamber of Commerce, the North Thurston School District, and Lacey businessmen like Bob Bloom and Al Holman, and they formed a committee to begin the process of incorporating Lacey as a city. Well, it took only two days for signatures to be gathered for the incorporation effort. Leading up to the election in August of 1964, there were many town hall meetings where emotions were high and heated words were exchanged. And while Lacey business interests, almost all of them supported a new city, not all of the residents were in favor of it. 
Many just wanted to stay in the unincorporated part of Thurston County. So many residents asked the county if they would please delete their property from the potential map of Lacey. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see that they actually physically taped up pieces of paper to the areas that were going to be deleted from this map. In the end, incorporation was defeated that year with only 37% voting for it. It didn't take long then for Olympia to start looking at annexation again. And on the other side, the committee for incorporating Lacey as a city felt that there was enough interest generated through this election that they would try it again. So in before a year was even up, the two sides were back at it again. Well, meanwhile, Bob Bloom, was looking at another opportunity, as he said, and that was the guise of Interstate 5. He talked about how it was a river of commerce with traffic moving back and forth and people and residents moving and businesses, and everywhere there was an off-ramp, there would be a new port city, and as he said, there was an off-ramp in Lacey at Sl on Slater Kenny. And he went to the Olympia Business Interest to find to get the money for that, and they laughed at him and said, nobody wants to go to, to Lacey to shop. Thank you, I really appreciate you setting me up for this. I was handsome, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were bald, too. <laughs> and modest. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and by 1966, South Sound Center was a reality. And as the election for incorporation drew near the second one in 1966, the fire department started to draw up the boundaries of what they hoped would become Lacey, which included a hotly contested part of the fire department's boundaries all the way to Boulevard Road in Olympia. And it was about a third larger than the one that voters had already turned down in 1964. Well, this time the sides were clearly drawn because either incorporate as the city of Lacey or Olympia was going to annex the heart of Lacey's business district in Queen South Sound Center. And we had an orange circle here a minute ago that showed some of the area that was going to be annexed into Olympia. A group of Olympia businessmen pushing for annexation, including Mo Loveless of Panorama, made it clear that if the election failed, they would begin the steps to annex Lacey. This time around, even more residents asked the county to delete them from the incorporation map, but this time the county stayed out of it. And the Daily Olympian, which, yeah. which ran an, an in-depth expose over three days. They never were right, you know that. <laughs> we'll just keep your opinions over there. I work for the city of Lacey, so oh, I don't okay. have an she opinion can't get on that. that kind of stuff. Anyway, the Olympian came out in favor, decidedly, of annexation to Olympia because the way they put it, the cost of starting up a new city would be too great. Reading these articles 50 years later, I've got to say that it must have seemed really patronizing to the people of Lacey, the way they were being characterized. As though it was Lacey as the little skinny kid sister with Olympia the big brother and his arm around her going, oh, you can't do this without me. And the little kid sister being like, hm, yeah, just watch me. You know, I like watching you do that. You know? <laughs> I might be a little sister myself. Yeah, she's also a little ham once in a while, too. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that vote took place on November 8, 1966, and much to the surprise of the Olympian, and even some people in Lacey, Incorporation won the day with just 300, 240 votes. 240 votes. Yeah, don't different. give us more, right? Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And because it was so close, the results were not certified until December 5th, almost two weeks later than required by law. I'm betting that the people on that election day felt much like we did on this election day. That's what I was, you know, I was gonna say that, but I thought you'd get upset with me if I did that. <laughs> we just won't get into specifics, will we? But that yes, wasn't- Yes, for what? <laughs> no, don't. They don't want us to actually fight up here. <laughs> All right. All right. That wasn't the last. Get back to the script. I am trying, but you keep interrupting me. That was not the last fight with the city of Olympia. Far from it. Some of the people who lived in that fringe area, the Boulevard Road area, they were kind of really upset at the results of this election, and the returns in their area were decidedly not in favor of incorporation. 
Lady C Lacey City Council, who had thought that the county would delete people's property from the map like they had done in the election before, were surprised that that didn't happen. And so they were very willing to let anyone who was unhappy revert back to the county. So they got together and scheduled an election um, so that those people could revert back to the county. Uh, this is the uh, third election now. So yes. So they went to schedule that and it got scheduled in February. Unfortunately, the Olympia business interests had beat them to the punch and had scheduled an election for the same area only to have it go straight to Olympia instead. And their election was scheduled in January instead of February. So because their election was first, we have no idea how the other election might have gone. Who knows? But the, um, here we go. Yeah, I should have advanced the slide. Your, yeah. your slide to kind of my script. Um, well, I was busy talking. <laughs> <laughs> so that, oh, that circle up there is the area that we are talking about here. So what happened was um, round two of this election was won by Olympia with a two-thirds majority. Many thought that this was going to be the end of it, but many residents who thought that they'd won their election fair and square filed a suit alleging illegal voting activity, and this court battle went all the way to the Washington Supreme Court. But we all know how it ended because that circle is now part of Olympia. Well, with the beginning of cityhood, Lacey faced some problems. Had no money, no staff, and no idea of what it was going to do. So that first year was spent hiring a police force, buying a water system, getting street lights, and setting up a revenue stream. And a year later, by 1967, Lacey was the second fastest growing city in the state. You want to know who the first was? Aaron knows. I don't know. I can't believe you just did that to me. He knows that I don't know. <laughs> but he wants me to find out. But I can't find out. Haven't been able to find out. Okay. I'm sorry. I won't do it to you again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the next controversy came in 1969 when Olympia decided that they would annex the entire city of Alacy all at one time, which would have merged the two cities into one. This did at least have to be approved by the residents of both cities. They did, by the way, since we're here in Tumwater, consider including Tumwater in that, but they thought they'd do one bite at a time. <laughs> Olympia defeated the motion by a margin of only 30 votes. Lacey, however, said no by a three to one margin. Well, although that issue was clearly over, the battle was not. The first one came over a bus system. Now, Lacey leaders wanted bus service to bring customers to South Sound Center and to Bob's Place and other Lacey businesses. Olympia had bus services around the Tumwater, but not into Lacey. In the end, after a lot of negotiations, Lacey was blackmailed. It had to agree to buy into the bus system, pay an entrance fee, and pay to have the service extended. Blackmail? Don't you think that's a little strong? No, it's not strong enough. I'd say something else if, if I wrote it. Also not in the script. She then, for the city of Lacey. Just be careful. <laughs> then Lacey needed sewers. Most of the city was on septic systems, and in many parts of the city, the land was not conducive to long-term septic use. Olympia owned and operated the only sewer system in the area, and Lacey couldn't afford to start its own system. So connection to Olympia's system was really the only solution. And again, battle lines were drawn. And again, this time with help from the Department of Ecology, Lacey had to agree to buy into the system, pay an entrance fee, and let Olympia manage it. And if you want to know what happened then, you need to talk to John Halverson here, a former mayor of Lacey, and he can tell you all about those struggles with Olympia and Lacey over sewers. Well, those battles led to intergovernmental agreements like intercity transit and lot, Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater sewer system. Continued negotiations eventually put Lacey and Olympia on the same footing. Now there are intergovernmental agreements and joint partnerships between the cities, including 911, or 911, <laughs> when you read this stuff, it looks like 911 and animal services. And in the 70s and the 80s, Lacey came to dominate retail shopping in, in Thurston County until the Capitol Mall was opened on Olympia's west side in the 1980s. And in no time at all, those mall owners who are international shopping center owners with deep pockets took a major portion of the retail trade. Well, Lacey began to make a name for itself in 1986 when... Does you know you got his picture up Yeah, there? he likes it. <laughs> I bet he does. <laughs> yeah. And he was hired as the new city manager and under the leadership of him and Kay 
Boyd, who was the mayor at the time, the Lacey City Council annexed the property known as Hawks Prairie and made it part of the city of Lacey. Though it was beginning to look further east and north and the city leadership eyeing new businesses, Lacey began to emerge as more than just that skinny little kid sister that, that Aaron was talking about. But in my mind, there are two events that remove any doubt that Lacey was becoming its own community. Now, under the leadership of Greg Cuyo, the city was able to get public facility district money. Now, that, that money had originally been dedicated by the, the uh, legislature for creation of convention centers and tourist promotion activities. And Olympia thought it was their money. They were on to build a convention center in downtown Olympia, but they couldn't agree on where, and they couldn't even give what they wanted to. And the city of Lacey, and Greg Cuyo and, city, and the finance director, Blaine Martin, said, you know, I think if we're good, we can slip in and take this money away from Olympia. Well, they did. They got 73% of the money for the regional athletic complex, the RAC, uh, and, and the other money, 27%, was retained by Olympia for the hands-on children's museum. Now, the RAC, it's called, put the city on the sports map, but it also gave rise to the fact that Lacey was somebody to be reckoned with. Then in 2001 came 9-11 and the war against terror. It was then that the residents of Lacey began to realize the large number of military families who reside in this community, in the Lacey community, and with the leadership of the Hawks Prairie Rotary Club, it came the creation of the Military Family Support March and the Homecoming Statue on Marvin Road. Lacey is now a military family with close ties to all the, all the military in this community. Retired military and military spouses have involved themselves deeply in the community. It's estimated by the city uh, fathers and mothers that about 40% of Lacey residents have some connection to the military. Lacey in the 21st century has become its own thriving city. And a note about the rack too that we were just talking about. Did I that one? no, no, I'm just adding. Um, uh, see, that I have facility. To the <laughs> yes, that facility is so popular. It's booked. 50 weeks of the year. It's pretty much only Christmas and Thanksgiving that it's not booked up for. It's amazing. So a sign of the city of Lacey's... Are we getting back to the Indians? Yes, we are. <laughs> a sign okay. of its modern identity, the city of Lacey signed an accord with the Nisqually tribe in March 2014, which, while acknowledging the historical ties between the two communities, also called for an annual renewal of this relationship and a working together toward mutually beneficial goals. And there is now a totem pole that resides at City Hall, and it's a gift from the tribe to recognize this accord, and it's a daily visual reminder of this partnership. And if you haven't seen it, you should. It's a really beautiful addition to our lobby. And although Lacey still occasionally grapples with its identity, and this is sometimes mentioned in the newspaper, <laughs> residents say that what they love about Lacey is its natural beauty, many beautiful parks to enjoy, a wide variety of community events, which are usually free, many opportunities for recreation, an excellent school system, and an amazing fire department, and pride in our diversity. The North Thurston Public Schools is one of the most diverse in the county, and the military families. But what really sets us apart is the people of Lacey. Well, that's the city council. Yes, it is. <laughs> I think those, I think they're all going to be defeated at the next election. <laughs> Not after this. <laughs> that looks like they're a fun group. Yeah, well, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> what? Stop there. All right. We hope that you will have and continue to join us in our 50th anniversary celebration. We kicked it off in July with the really amazing family festival, 3rd of July fireworks, which was also the 50th anniversary of the fireworks. Which was started by Bob Bloom, incidentally, at South Sound Center 50 years right. ago. Right, exactly. Bob actually used to pay for the fireworks displays out of his own pocket. No, you used to. I did. <laughs> You're right, Ken. I just forgot. <laughs> and we celebrated the city's birthday just a couple weeks ago on December 5th with a really fun party. We had several hundred people there, um, and there was cake. 
sorry you missed it. <laughs> or hopefully you didn't. And then we also had a wonderful lighted parade and the lighting of the Christmas tree. It was a really good time. And what Karen Darren didn't say is that we probably had two to 3,000 people for the parade and for the Christmas tree lighting. Or were you going to get to that? No, I just was waiting to see what number you were going to make up. <laughs> I think there are probably close to five to 7,000 oh, people yeah. there. <laughs> We don't know how many people were there. There were a lot of people there. <laughs> they were four deep at the roads. Would you like parade. to tell these nice people what events are coming up that they can go to? According to my script, you can still be involved in this celebration because we are continuing with events through July 2017. The Mayor's Gala is April 28th, and it's going to be a fundraiser for the Veterans Center, which is in, in Lacey. The Veterans Center, by the way, is uh, the only one... Uh, south of, I think, of Pierce County. Vets had to go up to Pierce County and King County to get services, and now Lacey has a veteran center. We also created a traveling exhibit. Aaron created a traveling exhibit called Shaping Our Community Together. So your business, your or school, or organization can borrow for free one or all 10 of those panels to display and educate people about Lacey's history. And there uh, are flyers out in the front. If you're interested, take one of those. And incidentally, uh, the Lacey Museum is open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from uh, 11. Don't say it. You're going to say the wrong. From 11 to 3, noon to 4, 10 to 2, sometime Thursday, Friday, and Saturday around lunchtime. <laughs> Luckily, there are rack cards also on the back table that have the hours on the and, back. And Aaron is the curator of the Lacey Museum. If you haven't been to the Lacey Museum and you care about or you want to know more about Lacey's history, you really should go because a lot of the stuff that we talked about is expanded to bond in that museum. And the last event of oh, the 50th year. anniversary celebration is the South Sound Barbecue, which will be this year on July 8th. We hope that you will join us for this really fun family event that will also feature music of the 60s to celebrate Lacey's birth year, 1966. You can find out more about any of these events by visiting the City of Lacey's website at www.ci.lacey.wa.us slash 50th. Now we are, we are I done. said that and he'll probably put it up on the screen in a little nice thing so it'll be on the screen for people at home to see. We are done with our official presentation, but uh, Aaron and I will answer questions about Lacey. I'll answer questions about anything. But there, There's Aaron, a limit. Aaron Ken. will give you the facts and I'll just tell you a great story. So if you have any questions. You what? One thing you didn't uh, highlight was St. Martin's College and University. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, First of all, St. Martin did not play a significant role in, in the incorporation effort. Well, actually, they played a role in the anti-incorporation right. effort. Oh, they, 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 they came out in 1964 against the incorporation. They wanted to be in Olympia. And in fact, I don't think they changed their city until, until, until about 1980-something. They yeah. changed, decided they were in Lacey instead of Olympia and changed their mailing address. Uh, so that's so I was being diplomatic, <laughs> not they didn't really putting have that much in. To do. They didn't oppose it, you know, significantly. just said they wanted to be in Olympia. Well, they, didn't, they didn't favor it. And in the papers in 1966, um, it came out that people had been upset that St. Martin's University and the North Thurston Public School Districts were making public statements about which side they were on. So by the time that second election happened, they were not publicly stating. Way in the back, back there, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, Panorama, what about Panorama? Were they for or against? They Pan were against. Panorama was originally against uh, Mo Loveless. The founders thought that they would get a better deal and, and be able to give more city support if they were in Olympia. And now Panorama has been there now longer than the city of Lake because they opened in, in 1963, the first resident moved in. Yep. And I know we have a lot of Panorama people here because I saw the bus pull up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John? Yeah? I was just going to say, St. Martin's became our friend because they sold us the yes. acreage where the city hall is right now. Yep. Provided we cut as few trees as possible. And, and I love that that was part of the agreement. I love working yeah, there among the yeah. trees. It's beautiful. And they also had another another agreement. They had 714 acres. They sold five acres to the city of, of, Olymp of Lacey under the condition that there'd be no jail. They didn't want a jail there. So we don't have a jail. We have a holding facility, but we don't have a jail. <laughs> and a holding facility means we can't keep more than 24 hours. So. Lucky for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have done this thing a dozen times. That's the first time she's ever taken me to this thing. I am speechless. Well, not really. You leave the door open. Back here in the picture. 
What's the status of the new museum? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> the city council purchased a, an additional piece of property and a building on August 11th of this year. And the city council has also put in next year's budget for us to do some re-envisioning and planning with this new piece of property. So the next year will be a planning year. And then um, we'll have a better timeline of exactly when we think that the museum may open. And um, we will expect to write a capital heritage grant, which the next round is not um, available to apply for until 2018. And that will probably be the big impetus to get us most of our um, reconstruction. And where would done. the public find that museum, you think? It's on Pacific Avenue and Lacey Boulevard. The address is 5700 Lacey Boulevard. Right now it's a big warehouse-like metal building, but oh, I, I can see so many it's beautiful right things down from happening Santa there. Right there yes. Mm -hmm. Almost across from the post office, almost. John, you had another question or a comment? Well, I'll just say that as being the first and for eight years as the chairman of the uh, public facility district, right. there's a heck of a story about how we uh, <laughs> obtained the 70% of the money. And I'd be happy to tell you about that sometime. Yeah. Yeah. That was a four year war. That's, I would love to talk yeah, to you later. There are, there are many wars. That, I mean, the sewer system was a big, was a big fight. I mean, fought with Olympia and that for decades. Olympia was telling Lacey where the sewers had to go and how many, how many hookups they could have. And, because Olympia didn't want Lacey to outgrow it, and it's a, it's a big struggle. Not you got another thing? Not to worry, I negotiated the full payment back to Lacey of everything, only charged them back in the beginning for that. Industry. All right, thank you, John, for all that. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a information somewhere on the early settlers in the area there? Lacey? There is. Um, the museum has a wonderful archives. Um, which if you, uh, my business cards are on the back table and anyone can make requests to view or research or see what we have. Um, but yeah, we have lots of information on the early settlers. I think Panorama will take a bus to the Lacey Museum someday. Yeah. Yes, can you tell me a little bit about Hawkesbury, the origin of it and how it was incorporated or, or became part of, of Lacey? We're, we live out at Jubilee. So we're highly interested in, in the hand-holding of Hawkesbury and Lacey. Well, I'll tell you what. I can probably tell you, but it probably wouldn't be true, but John Halverson can tell you because he was, he was on the city council at that time. <laughs> yeah. There was an annexation, and of course, in, when it's generated by the people that own the land out there, if you own 60% of the value of 60%. the land, then you get to be a player in this. So. It, it was a full legal annexation process to be incorporated into the city of Lacey. And they, they did it specifically because they knew that was going to be the future growth area for the city, and they wanted to get the businesses and the retail businesses going out there. And it's been a major impact on Lacey and has been significant as far as revenue goes. I only have one comment. Stop the building. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's killing you know, us out there. Two lane roads. Right? Yeah. You're, you're right about the roads. Uh, I mean, the, there, are, there are two lane roads. Uh, there, there are only three roads across Interstate 5 out there, and they're all two lane roads. Right. And the city is in the process of, of, of updating their transportation plan. They're, they're trying to get some federal money for some of those projects. They will be upgrading some of those roads as soon as they possibly can. But you're right. I mean, there's only three roads across Interstate 5 that take you to the North Park. Right. Maybe do a timeout until all that infrastructure well, is there, done. Well, there's a great opportunity coming up for the city council going on the road. They'll be at Salish Middle School right by where we live and up there. And I can't remember the exact date, but it's a city council work session, mm -hmm. and it's on the website. And you could share yeah. the, during the public comment portion. Don't, don't voice your, your mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a lot of folks that are sure. really concerned about it. <laughs> you know, that is, it just yeah, yeah, you've moved there now. Nobody else should move in there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now we're back here to say in the green. Me? Oh. Yeah, you. <laughs> Where does the name Lacey come from? <laughs> we always get asked that question. We do. Because uh, I just kind of rushed by it. You want the story or you want the facts? <laughs> I'll take this one. <laughs> All right. So. When the city of Lacey applied for a post office in 1891, or the town of Woodland, I should say, they applied for a post office called Woodland. 
but they their application was rejected by the federal government because there was already a woodland in Washington down by the Columbia River. And the post office was really clamping down on its regulations for naming post offices. And so it had to be a short name and it had to be unique. It couldn't be like anyone else's name. And the tradition story goes, which may or may not be true, we don't really know, the, the postmaster knew this lawyer, real estate developer guy named O.C. Lacey, and perhaps he took care of the paperwork, perhaps he took it upon himself. His name was Lacey, and the post office became named Lacey. But we don't really have any evidence to suggest why Come that, on, no, no, stop. There's no <laughs> evidence. Come on now. You got a guy, he's a lawyer, He's a real estate agent, and he's filling out and the he paperwork. And he didn't do anything here. No, he there's no it. proof he filled out he, the paperwork. He, I mean, come on. It's How in, many laces are there? It's in <laughs> Carpenter's he, he hand. Of, oh, it's in the postmaster's hand. We, we, we don't know. Yes, we know that, that part. <laughs> That'll always be unknown. Arm wrestle? <laughs> no. I, I, I arm wrestled one time and she beat me. <laughs> she said, I'm, I'm wrestling champ. You couldn't believe it. <laughs> so what happened was that name Lacey became attached to the post office and over time it became the name of the city. It was both for a while and then the train depot changed its name and then the school changed its name and then the voting precinct changed its name. By 1931, everything was called Lacey. And Bob has a question. I do. Or is it Chris that has a question? Well, we're confused. So let's just proceed on. I'm not. I'm just anonymous. So um, Lacey currently, the Lacey metro area is divided into two sections. One is Lacey City proper and the outlying areas. Could you tell us how, what the population is for the city of Lacey and the Lacey outlying area? First of all, let's, let's specify the city, all cities in the state of Washington are required to, to have a growth management area, areas outside the city limits that they expect that eventually will be incorporated into the city. Olympia has one, Tumwater has one, Lacey has one. Uh, Lacey's population is about 40, 41, 42,000 right now. It's mm -hmm. estimated that probably, thank you, 46. See, you got to have facts. <laughs> is it, is it, we, we estimate there's between 50 and 60,000 people living in the Lacey growth area. That's out where you're at. The I mean, urban but growth you're, area. you're in the city, but out in that area out there on the other side. So there's about 60,000 people, maybe. We don't know exactly. Dan, do you have a better figure than that? It's a good estimate. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's the answer to that. So eventually, Lacey will have 100,000 people because we would eventually annex all that land in that's required by state law. It doesn't say when you have to annex it, though. It's supposed to be within 20 years. It's supposed to be, but it's been over 20 years. Yeah. No, it's been almost 40. Did we have to have any more questions back in the back? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Aaron, on the, on the uh, anniversary down in Hunnaburn Park, there was a display talking about the next 50 years of Lacey. Can you give a summary of that? The display on the next 50 years? Which one are you talking about? The next 50 years? It was supposed to be on the advertising that said that the past 50 years and then there was going to be a display talking about the next 50 years. Oh, the video. There's a video <laughs> that I didn't do that, so it wasn't on my mind. There was a video that was created called, um, I forget what exactly it's called, The Past, Present, and Future of Lacey. Yes. And so it addresses both the past and the present 50th anniversary and then the future. And I believe, I'm not 100% positive, but I believe that that is available on YouTube. Um, but I can find that out. Yeah, and I, I saw the video at least 12 times because I'm on it. <laughs> I I'm in it too. Did you see me in it? Were you in it too? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm in it playing the guitar and singing Lacey's new song. We wrote, I wrote a song for the Lacey's called You Never a Stranger in Lacey. That's also on YouTube. It has 111 hits so far. <laughs> <laughs> and 30 of them are mine. <laughs> Do you have internet? I could pull it up. <laughs> I, I think we're done. I, we're done <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to have three hams here. <laughs> I used to be a ham, but I'm cured now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Don't forget to pick up a calendar on your way out. Uh, we have the, the calendars. And uh, our next talk will be in January. And so I hope you pick up one of those uh, schedules, too. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.
Thank you.